I was visiting the first time. Yeah, you want you want to tell about, these fine folks why why you decided to move to Lenox, Alabama? I mean, you, so, you can you can use names and details if you want. I don't think anybody's going to get offended by that. But yeah, no, share what just, you want. You know, I wanted to basically serve, be in full time ministry, and that's basically that was it. And I came to visit uh, to meet you. Actually, and we became very good yep. friends. Very good, friends. and. Um, as I was there, the executive secretary resigned and I was offered the position and I prayed about it. Um, I firmly believe the Lord gave me a sign that I was supposed to be there and I moved there uh, yeah. in about a month or two after that. And uh, so I went back to New York to finish my semester and pack up and everything else. And as I was away, that was, I believe, the first time that Chris Jones came. Right. And uh, he brought the and with him. You and, and I were him. actually talking at that time um, via text messages. And, and to give a little context to uh, mine and Yulia's relationship, uh, Kent likes to play matchmaker. That's his gig. That's his thing. Um, he doesn't have very much discernment when he's matching people up. Yulia and I are wonderful friends. We have a great friendship totally platonic but you know that was how we met uh yulia and i uh, we we even talked about you know starting a family and all that so you know kent hoven had had kind of joined us together in in that sense but you know it it didn't it didn't work out and that's okay you know if 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 people aren't compatible uh romantically that's just something that happens but you know the good thing is and i don't regret you know being able to cultivate our friendship despite being in an environment that was toxic. Um, so yeah, Yulia, um, go ahead and keep on going. I just wanted to add that a little bit for some context. Oh, yeah, kind dog, of, dog, dog plays yeah. matchmaker all the time. It's yes, he does. One of the things he likes to do. Um, so I don't even, I don't really care much about that. I don't mind that. It's just sometimes he can be a little aggressive. That's, you know, trying to get people together. That's gets a little uncomfortable. But um, when I was away for about two months in New York, finishing up my semester, I I get a call from Mark, and Mark was very, very, very disturbed. And he said, there's this man, his name is Chris Jones. He is here with a boy who's about 12 years of age. He was 11 uh, at the time. 11. Yes, and he had just turned 11. boy is not his son or his relative in any way, shape, or form. Um, and it's just, he just randomly showed up with this child who's very clearly not his child. And that's one thing if like a family friend, but this man has sex charges against him. Right. And let's be honest, Chris is white as a snowflake, like literally, and Zaire yeah. is of African descent. So, you know, just yes. genetically so speaking, was, it's apparent that I they are not biologically related. Yeah. yeah. It was disturbing. Yeah, and um, I remember that you were freaking out. Um, I remember—I don't know if you even recall this, but you wanted nobody else knew, so everybody knew Chris was there. But Doc threatened, threatened you because you found out his background, mm -hmm. and you said that Doctor Hoven ordered you not to tell because there were other families with small children there, and you said that Doctor Hoven told you if you tell anyone, he will throw you out with your daughter. And That's you right. were terrified. And I told you, you have to tell Freddie because Freddie has four small kids, four or five. Wow, it's been a long time. He has small children. And there was, yeah. I believe, another family. You have to tell them. They have to know. And that's right. when you went and you told them. And uh, naturally, people were very upset. People put their children in the home. They would not let them go out. And I called Paul, who was at the time in a very good relationship with Doc. And I tried to ask him questions. What's going on? Who's this small child? Um, and Paul told me to the effect of everything is just fine. And the only problem is that, that this boy just has nobody. And, you know, he, out of kindness of his heart, is taking care of this child. Right. And I said that all of this looks extremely creepy. And I said, I'm, fax me over documents. I will sign 
to be his guardian until his mother is found or until he turns 18. Yeah. I will do that. You like, you practice some law, send me documents, I'm going to sign because this is severely creepy. This man has charges against children, Zaire's age, and he is bringing this boy very clearly. He is bringing him out of state uh, to Alabama. He crossed multiple state lines. And this, it, 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 it was very, and then I'm calling Dr. Hoven and I'm like, okay, I'm going to be the executive secretary. I'm going to try to reason with him and talk to him. And he just would not, he was, um, he has this thing because he feels that he was wrongfully convicted. And in all honesty, you know, he has charges. He was not correctly paying taxes and he was did not withdraw the correct amount from his bank account. And all in all, those charges, they are, you know, document charges. They're not nothing like molesting a child, nothing crazy. And he feels he was in many ways wrongfully accused. So if any person comes to him and tells him I was wrongfully accused, doesn't matter what it is. He will believe you automatically. And that's what happened. Chris told him I was wrongfully accused and Dr. Hoven believed him and he was protecting him, convincing him. And I tried to plead with him. I tried to ask him to please make people feel safe because he's the head of this ministry and just nothing. Yeah. So, so I spoke to Paul and Paul told me that he got in touch almost or something like that with the mother that the mother knows he's there everything is great yeah, and i kept repeating happen. yeah um i kept repeating that you know even if the family is fine with it maybe they don't know the charges that are laid against this man and this is right. all very disturbing that when you call like i asked her for her phone number to call and to speak with her um I was never given a phone number. I kept calling, calling Paul, asking him to send documents so that I can sign off. And Mark also made the, made the same offer for him or for me to be unofficial or official guardians until the mother is found. Because what the story we were told is that there is a mother and she has major, major problems with alcohol and she just cannot take care of him. That's right. the story we were told. And later it came out, it wasn't true. Yeah. And it's just, I wanted to call the sheriff, um, but I spoke to Paul. Paul told me he reviewed the documents that he was fraudulently accused. And, and not just that, not only did they read the documents, but they claimed to have spoken to the sheriff. And, and Kent said that he called three times. And of course, he, he kind of trails off and said, and left a message, you know, that he didn't really make a concerted effort to find out the legality of what we now know to be um, a class C felony for Chris, plus, you know, whatever comes out in the trial that's going to be, it's pretty inevitable at this point. Um, but also, Kent would be implicated in criminal conspiracy. And I say that because, you know, in Alabama, if, if you facilitate or arrange for a registered sex offender, to have an overnight visit in a house with a minor, that, that is a felony in Alabama. Well, actually, if you arrange it and accommodate it, that, that is a misdemeanor, but it is criminal conspiracy. But, you know, it, what pastor wants to have their name tied to a man who abuses little boys? You know, it's just, it's, it's unfathomable how anybody could look at this situation knowing the facts we have now and the testimony that we have now. And, and Yulia, I believe this is the first time you've actually been public, I think. Is that right? Yes. So I would like to thank you because, number one, it's very brave of you to, to come forward and tell your story. You know, a lot of people don't have the courage to speak out against someone like Kent because, you know, when you're a victim of abuse, it has more than just physical ramifications it has psychological it has spiritual ramifications because these abusers will use what you are vulnerable where you are vulnerable and they will 
take advantage of that. And then once they have you at, under their thumb, you become a sort of slave to them. And, and like you were saying, if you, if you talk about this, if you talk about that, you're gone. You know, that's just got all the, the earmarks of an actual cult, which, I mean, if, if screaming, we're not a cult, we're not a cult every night on YouTube doesn't, doesn't raise red flags about it being an actual cult, you know, you might want to have your head checked because it, it, it is what it is, you know, and, and the reality of the situation is not only is it a cult, but it's become a haven for drug users. It's become a haven for pedophiles. It's become a haven for criminals and, and all sorts of deviants from all sorts of walks of life. And one of the biggest problems with that is, you know, Kent will tell you that you have to practice forgiveness and extend grace. And yes, that's true to a degree. But when you have an unrepentant child molester who is adamant about you know, I was set up, I was set up. Of course a child molester is going to say I was set up because they don't want to get raped in prison. And, you know, I'm not really trying to keep the show G-rated or anything, but, you know, that's just just the way it is. So w when we when we sit back and see all that, like, it, it it's scary. It is. It's scary. And it's not just scary for those that are watching, but it is for those involved. Whether they realize it yet or not, this is going to have an effect on their life. And uh, I, I'm going to stop talking about that for just a second. I see that uh, Deviant Outcast had some questions he wanted to ask. So I'm going to give him the floor for a minute. And um, let's just, uh, you know, let's have a nice friendly chat and and hang out. Deviant, you there? Can you hear me? Well... No, you couldn't hear me because I was muted. I muted myself. Oh, there we go. <laughs> All right. So I, uh, I'm, I'm, if I sound weird, it's because I, a, not, uh, uh, as you may hear, I'm not English. I'm not American, um, and I'm not used to speaking to people. Yeah, um, that's perfectly fine. Um, <laughs> actually, I'm the one in this broadcast that sounds weird because. I've got the minority of the American accent over here. You know, you've heard Yulia. She's she's born in Ukraine, raised in Ukraine for what was it, twelve years? Mm -hmm. Oh, so she she immigrated to the United States um, when she was just a little girl. So <laughs> when you say you sound weird, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm the one that has the accent in this group so far. So yeah, go ahead. It's okay. nice to have you here, by the way. Yeah, yes, if anybody I'm you want to ask me questions, you're more than welcome to. Yeah, because I, I was a bit confused. I've, I've been following this. Um, I can say I, in in some weird way, it felt kind of good. It sounds terrible, I know. Uh, but when, when Cindy came out uh, and told her story, it was a, um, ah, what's it called? Uh, a relief. In a way, yeah. Because from the moment I saw that man, uh, I think it was in a debate with uh, Aaron Ra. Uh, the first time I I saw him, and he's it just screamed narcissist. You know, I think yeah. it's when when it gets into your body, it it's it's in your spine. Well. In, in that one, case, one. I would even go as far as to say it's in your nature, you know, you, you act on what your nature craves and desires. And when you walk around, you know, abusing people that you're supposed to protect, and yeah. then when, when they say something about that abuse, you gaslight them and make them feel crazy. You, you've just compounded their victimhood because not only have you abused them, but you've minimized that abuse. And, yeah. and that's no place for a pastor. There, there's no place yeah. for yeah. that in the church. No, it's, it's, it's horrible because, uh, I mean, all abuse is re repulsive. Uh, but when, when it's from a, a pastor or a minister or priest uh, or even from, like, any authority figure, but I think especially 
when it's from within the church, uh, because that's something that has to do with the You're innermost view. Yeah. Yeah. The church is supposed to be a safe place. Yeah. You know, the, the Bible often compares, you know, pastors with shepherds. And yeah. The shepherd's job is to protect the flock from predators, not not to invite predators into the fold and to actually be one yourself. And, and that's the situation that we found ourselves in concerning Kent. He has allowed predators to come into his inner circle and yeah. not just one. I say predators in, in the plural sense because it's not just one. Um, it, there are more than one and there's more than two. I, I don't have the exact count that I can verifiably, you know, tell, but I, I can name three sex predators that have been in that camp since my time there. Um, I, I, I'm not really going to bring up names other than, well, you know what? I, I will, because I have no sympathy and no respect of privacy for these, these monsters. It's Chris Jones who uh, spent the early 2000s and who knows how long giving kids rides in his limousine and pulling down mm. their pants and then playing strip poker with some kids to teach them a lesson. And like, this is just not the, appropriate. That story just screams fake. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was going to, to teach them, but I, I knew uh, I couldn't just reprimand them because they would do it again and it would be worse. So I came up with this game and I fixed the cards and no, no. Right. And one of the, one, one detail about that story is, you know, Kent promotes Chris's innocence and he defends, you know, against accusations that Chris hasn't just been accused of or no. alleged. Th these are, these are crimes that were tried by a jury of his peers. It was, the verdict was upheld in an appellate court. And there's absolutely no recourse through the legal system to even touch that again. It can't be revisited. Paul, not Paul, but Chris is out of options as far as his pr presumed innocence, which he has none anymore. There's no, if you say that he's innocent, you're lying. Yeah. Um, and, and Chris, can't not only says he's innocent, but he twists the stories to, to shift the blame on the victim. So when Kent talks about the strip poker game, he's going to set it up like this. The kids were playing strip poker. Chris was minding his own business. They pressured him to join the game. And he ultimately ended it like the good hero that he was. Oh, of but out of Chris's own mouth, he will tell you the story that you just yeah. talked about and and it's it's like which which source are you going to believe are you going to believe the second hand source that contradicts the source that's straight from the horse's <laughs> mouth you know or are you gonna you're gonna look at the truth and see what actually happened and and what happened is absolutely disgusting and yeah. and and just a second i would like to in, i'd like to welcome my friend here by the square we uh we go back can i use your name is that yeah. all right so this is Trey. Uh, we were battle buddies. We went to Iraq together. We served this country in uh, in the military. We were both 11 Bravo. And Trey, I just want to start off by saying thank you for your service. Well, I, appreciate I, it. I, I know you put in work for this country um, and, and everybody should, you know, show them a little love for that, if nothing else. But uh, I asked you here, Trey, because um, I, don't, I don't know how familiar you, familiar you are with this whole situation concerning Kent Hovind and uh, Chris Jones and all, all that stuff. I think I've talked to you briefly about some of it. Yeah. But um, one of the things I wanted to bring you on here, uh, Kent Hovind went on a live uh, stream yard broadcast sort of like this with some other folks. And, and he said things along the lines of me being dishonorably discharged from the military for being a psychopath. And uh, yep, it, I, I know you guys see that face because it's so unbelievable. This is a man right here who served alongside me. And I didn't even preface what was going on in this group. But without even putting any pressure on him, I'm going to let him go ahead and vouch for, you know, the kind of a person that I am and, and the kind of service that 
I did when I was, you know, in, in the sandbox with you. Mark, just one second. I cannot stay for very long. Um, That's fine. So if anybody has any questions for me. Um, I would just you know? like to, to say how, how sorry I am for the situation in your home country. Yeah, it, it's a difficult situation. Yeah. And, and Yulia, um, this stream is going to be going, you know, just as long as it does. I don't have a time frame. I don't have anything else going on today. And uh, I had, I think, 20 viewers earlier. So and the conversation was pretty interesting. But yeah, if you've got something to do, feel, feel free to step out, go take care of business and you can come back anytime. So and, and of course, feel free to call me and, and I can definitely forward any questions somebody may have for you if you miss that when you're taking care of your business. So, yeah. Um, but Trey, uh, to get back to you, like just just go ahead and, um, you know, kind of speak your mind about what you know about me. I know you don't know a lot about the situation that, you know, is the topic of this discussion, but, you know, I think it's important that people hear from somebody else that's not me that was in the service with me that can speak to my character. Well, um, during my time in deployment with you, um, I'll say you as a model soldier, uh, squared away, uh, always did what you was told. Um, very well knowledgeable with your task. Good at performing task. Um, we were in the sandbox together, and uh, I I never known you to ever turn down a mission to go outside the wire. Uh, every time there was a mission coming up, you were chalk running, you know, running whatever you know, convoy escorts and whatever stuff we had to do. Um. <clears throat> You were there at every training exercise. Um, never seen you get in trouble. Now I got in trouble. I got but in trouble once. Um, but the fun, a funny story there. I I was looking at getting an Article Fifteen, but what ended up happening was I put I was put on guard duty as a as a punishment, and the Air Force awarded me with a commendation award. So <laughs> I got in trouble. I did. Um, I did something I shouldn't have done. Uh, I, I don't really regret it because, you know, that's that's my story. That's my life. That's part of me. But, you know, I didn't do anything that put anybody in danger. I didn't jeopardize, you know, OPSEC or anything like that. I was just, you know, I had a little lady that, you know, I kind of wanted to get to know. And, you know, when you're in the sandbox for months on end, it it's difficult, <laughs> but you know, um, it is what it is. And, and that's a funny story. So yeah, I, I'm not, I'm not perfect. You know, I don't have the absolute most pristine military jacket by any means, but, uh, you know, it, it, it's just funny that, that, you know, people that know me can say, wow, that, that claim, that accusation that was brought against me is just so absurd. And, and like, you don't know a lot about the situation and, and really it's just, Man, it's good to talk to you again. Like it's been, oh, it's, it's been a while. You know, it's been a couple months, but you know, it's good to keep in touch with you for sure. Well, uh, you can uh, actually, if you wanted to, you can like you know block out you know your personal information, like your your social and stuff like that. But post your DD two fourteen where it shows your your discharge date and where it'll say honorable. Yeah, I've got it right here. Like it's it's in my desk drawer right next to me, and I could. I could easily bring it up and show everybody, but you know, I, I, I'll take your word for it. I mean, I know it's true. It does say honorable under the uh, character of service box, but yeah, I'd have to set up my camera and I don't really feel like doing that, but yeah, I, I do have a DD two fourteen, And if anybody is personally interested in seeing that for verification, well, screw you for, for not believing my friend, but <laughs> I will gladly provide that for you. You know, I don't have anything to hide and, and I'm not gonna, you know, bullshit somebody to that you know, extent. What sure. I understand about Kenneth, from what I gather about him, uh, he's a great deceptor. Um, mm -hmm. uh, like he, he's really good at deceiving folks and that's pretty much how he's built what he has through deception. Um, but if you, from what I have, seen 
you know, what people are brought to me about him. Um, he's not a well, you know, he's, he's, he's not a man of great character himself. Hmm. Right. Yeah. There, there's a saying something about don't cat stones. If you live in a glass house and, uh, you know, someone like Kent, he can't help it. You know, that's all he's got is a bunch of stones. He's got to throw them somewhere. And, and, and truth be told, you know, he, he's going to come out and say that I started all this and I'm crazy and all that. But in reality, when it comes down to it, all I've done is speak what I've seen. You know, I've talked about my experiences. And, and yeah, I've been a bit of an asshole towards Kent, and I think he deserves it. I think he deserves a lot more than that. But, um, you know, you're right. And, and this is coming from somebody, Trey, who's not followed Kent Hovind for any considerable amount of time. The only information he has received is from people who, you know, have kind of been paying attention. And, and you know, just that little bit of information that you've seen to, to know that his character is flawed speaks volumes to, you know, how deceived Kent himself is. If he thinks that he can say the things he says and do the things that he does and get away with it because it's out in the open, it's, it's all public record. You know, this stuff is not secret. So, uh, a friend of mine, John, was on a stream earlier today, and, and he was just pounding over and over again, Kent, you can't hide. You cannot hide. And he was discussing some things that was going on in Canada where they have been finding mass graves of dead children, allegedly from the sex rings. And, like, that's a big deal going on in Canada right now. And you can, uh, you can look up, you know, get on Google and if you know how to use that and, and find some information on that for yourself. And, and John, if you're out there, if you'd like to come on and join this, this stream, uh, since you are Canadian, you're welcome to come in and talk a little bit on that if you want to. Um, but yeah, uh, Trey, like you've probably watched not even a handful of Kent Hovind's videos. Oh right? yeah. Oh yeah. When the first time I ever, uh, and this is why I say it's a shame. Because the man does know how to articulate. Yeah. And when it comes to uh, talking about creation and proving that God exists, the way he argues is, you know, is that is outstanding. I, I I I did enjoy it. But when you start finding out the the, the real nature 